Welcome to Insights at the Edge, produced by Sounds True. My name's Tammy Simon. I'm the founder of Sounds True, and I'd love to take a moment to introduce you to the new Sounds True Foundation. The Sounds True Foundation is dedicated to creating a wiser and kinder world by making transformational education widely available. We want everyone to have access to transformational tools such as mindfulness, emotional awareness, and self-compassion, regardless of financial, social, or physical challenges. The Sounds True Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to providing these transformational tools to communities in need, including at-risk youth, prisoners, veterans, and those in developing countries. If you'd like to learn more or feel inspired to become a supporter, please visit SoundsTrueFoundation.org. You're listening to Insights at the Edge. Today is a rebroadcast of one of my favorite episodes. I hope you enjoy. You're listening to Insights at the Edge. Today my guest is Joanna Macy. Joanna is an eco-philosopher and a scholar of Buddhism, general systems theory, and deep ecology. A respected voice in the movements for peace, justice, and ecology, she interweaves her scholarship with five decades of activism. Joanna Macy founded and is the root teacher of the Work That Reconnects Network. This network was formed to bring us back into relationship with each other and with the self-healing powers in the web of life, motivating and empowering us to reclaim our lives, our communities, and our planet from corporate and colonial rule. In this episode of Insights at the Edge, Joanna Macy and I spoke about the great turning and the great unraveling, and how both are happening right now. We talked about how hope is not a feeling, it's something that you do. We also talked about the importance of naming what breaks our heart about our world situation and the environment, and how we unblock our energy to contribute when our pain for the world is experienced and expressed. We talked about apathy as the refusal or inability to suffer. And we also talked about how belonging to the earth as our greater body is our natural birthright and the source of our life energy. Here's my conversation with Joanna Macy. Joanna Macy, I want to begin by saying I feel very honored to have this chance to talk to you. So thank you so much for making the time. Thank you. Well, how wonderful to be in conversations right across the Rocky Mountains. I can picture you there, imagining you're in Boulder. Yes, and you are... In Berkeley by the San Francisco Bay. Wonderful. I had the chance recently, Joanna, to listen to a recording of a presentation you gave that was part of a two-year meditation teacher training program that Jack Cornfield and Tara Brock are leading. And you sounded so vigorous, so vital so engaged in the world. And I thought to myself, at 88 years old, Joanna Macy is doing incredibly well and is so engaged in life. And I'd love to be that way when I'm 88. So my first question to you is, what do you think are the secrets, if you will, to your level of vitality and engagement? (laughs) Well, you know, what we all can draw from is a lot older and a lot younger. Uh, as I'd say, uh, four billion years. I often tell my friends, let's act our age, not whether it's 16 or 66 or 86, but our true age because everything we are comes from the living sacred body of Earth. Every element of our bodies and the air we breathe, and the food we're going to eat. And so uh, 
it's time that we recognize that. I know we're impermanent. We're impermanent as ripples in a lake and bubbles in a river. But our true nature is the water that pours down. And uh, it's always invigorating to know your true source. Don't you find? Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's interesting when you say that let's act our age and that really we're billions of years old. I think most people still identify, yeah, but I'm 50 something or 60 something. You're describing. That's very boring. Yeah, you're describing a change of worldview. Is that really alive for you day to day? I feel like I'm billions of years old. <laughs> well, actually. It's been more alive in recent years, especially in the last year, when you see what we're facing with the unraveling of political, economic, ecological structures. And so uh, when we're faced with something uh, that demanding of our attention and that ex requiring our exploring who we really are and what's there for us and what what we want in our center of our being to be engaged in. Well, it's coming alive with the earth, protecting all life, don't you think? Well, you know, it's interesting because I, I read in your work and the philosophical underpinnings of the work that reconnects, which is the body of work and training that you've been engaged in for the past couple of decades, that you think not only of the earth being alive, but that the earth is our larger body. And I thought to myself, you know, for a lot of people, that's somewhat conceptual. They don't experience it really as a living truth, the earth is my larger body. Can you help me understand how someone could learn to live that more with real awareness, not just as a conceptual idea, oh, the earth is alive? Well, uh, one of the most dramatic demonstrations to me um, of the immediacy of this apprehension uh, was one I uh, described uh, at, that, at that meeting you mentioned, uh, which was um, in the mid-1980s in Australia with a uh, brave uh, rainforest activist, John Seed, who told that the greatest uh, epiphany, recognition of the true nature of the universe uh, was as he was defending uh, old growth forests, the great trees of the ancient continent of Gondwana land, from illegal logging and illegal pol uh, police connivance. And uh, they were outnumbered and they had no weapons or didn't want them. They just had their bodies standing between the uh, logging companies and the grappling hooks and, and the trees. And uh, then he, at that point, realized, oh, it's not me, John Seed, who's protecting the rainforest. The rainforest is protecting herself through this piece of humanity, which it, is, it over the millennia, cradled into existence. And that I immediately, that came not out of hearing nature mystics preach from the pulpit or reading poetry, though I must say one of the great vehicles for this recognition is often poetic and not conceptual. Conceptual thought is so often a rear view mirror using words for what we've already understood. But what opens the windows and doors are the requirements, the adventures we actually have in the flesh, as John C. did defending the rainforest. So it sounds to me, if I were to summarize this first part of our conversation, that the sense of vigor that you feel is this connection to the larger earth. And you said also during this time, during this time when I think many people are finding themselves, unfortunately, not more invigorated, but more despairing, more feeling defeated. How is it that you're able to have this sense of coming even more alive during the challenge? 
Well, you know, Tammy, um, day before yesterday on the year anniversary of the inauguration of our current president, there were people marching in cities across the country. And it was vigorous, and there was a lot of laughter and fantasy, too, and determination. So the uh, I'm seeing a lot of resilience and a lot of creativity in the uh, finding different ways to resist and to protect. Uh, out here, there's been a, a, a move, despite our declaration of, of sanctuary cities to protect undocumented and dreamers, the, a huge movement to just deport by strength and by attacking people where they can be found. And there's such a beautiful uh, resistance to this. So I think it's maybe a question of what I'm looking at. What I'm choosing to look at are the people who, or where my attention is arrested, are people who are saying this isn't, uh, uh, I, want to, I want to flourish in those parts of myself that can stay aligned with life and to move to where uh, life is uh, reinventing, uh, encouraging us to find ever new ways, new ways of capturing, you know, uh, carbon sequestration in the land and new ways of solving conflicts, all those things that in the work I do we call the great turning. The great turning is still happening. The media, ha <laughs> Our supine, compliant media doesn't focus on on uh, the, that truly creative aspect of the popular response to the current administration. You talk about how there are these three stories of our time. One story, which you're describing now, which you call the great turning, this engaged response where we're reinventing our world, we're in the midst of doing it. But you also say that one possible story for our time is the great unraveling, that we're, just to summarize it quickly, headed to the sixth extinction. This is what's happening. And that a third possible yeah. story is, oh, this is just business as usual. Let's all go back to our football games and paying off our mortgages. And my question to you is, you're clearly and invested. All happening. Right. You're clearly invested in the great turning. They're all happening. So it's just a question of, and this is what's the most emboldening thing and uh, uh, to treasure in our situation, is that we humans, uh, fallible and scared and dumb as we can be, we have the choice of where we put our attention. We have the choice on how we understand a given a set of experiences, because these three um, narratives about what's happening now are all true. There are uh, the voices that dominate are voices that say everything's going to be okay. We're going to make America great again, just the old way. We're going to grow our economy, grow our military power. We're going to distract ourselves witless with more and more entertainment. We're going to take what we can from the earth. Let's open everything up to mining and oil drilling, etc. So that's charged. But most of the voices we hear are that, aren't they? Then there are a few voices more that are saying, oh, but this is destroying everything. And that they're voices of the scientists that haven't been bought and the nuclear, and the, the, excuse me, the journalists that haven't been intimidated. But then there's another story, and it's happening too, a story of resistance and creativity and, and, and the shift in consciousness. That's part of that great turning story, where we choose to see our world not just as a supply house, and or a sewer, but to see it as a, a living body, 
And that's what I find the most exciting, Tammy, about this moment, because in this first years of the um, third millennium, both science and spirituality and religion, back from the indigenous ones right up to uh, current creation spirituality, are seeing that the earth is alive. This blows me away that at the very time when the earth is under such assault from greed and hatred and the urge to dominate, at the same time we are hearing voices from the indigenous folks right up to the uh, contemporary scientists and the new cosmologists and the evolutionary psychologists and the evolutionary scientists that the earth is uh, a living body from system science, Gaia theory. To me, this is stunning. And so we don't know which story is going to win out. Maybe we'll just pillage and plunder our earth to death. But we're given another story now. And the people that I find myself hanging out with more and more are people who can get uh, turned on by that, inspired by that, enlisted by that. I want to address that person who says, I see the possibility of the great turning, and I'm willing to work on it in my life. I want to be part of that. Joanna Macy, I want to be with you and the vigor you feel. But truth be told, kind of deep in my gut, I think we're involved in the great unraveling. I, I don't feel very optimistic. Oh, you're right. So that's right. I don't feel optimistic either. I think we put much too much um, value on optimism in America, especially in America, so that we, uh, so I think we overrate uh, hope in here because we're that we constantly taking our pulse as to how hopeful we feel. So in the book that I wrote with Chris Johnstone in England, Active Hope, we define hope not as something you have, as something you do, and you can see what you want to choose. And you take a step and then another step and you join people who are making that a reality. And with that understanding of hope, active hope, hope is a verb, you as a verb, then um, you are uh, it's okay, you, you are acting even when you're feeling hopeless. One of the big lights that went on for me when I was listening to this presentation you gave as part of this meditation teacher training program is that you gave a very interesting definition of apathy. You know, people think of apathy as a time when we feel just paralyzed because we're hopeless. And I think people do sometimes right now feel paralyzed. I just feel hopeless. And you define apathy as the refusal or inability to suffer. So help me understand how you yeah. came to that and how important that is. Well, I was, yeah, this was, Tammy, this was also very important to me about um, 40 years ago when uh, I was uh, engaged in activism around uh, nuclear power plants and nuclear weapons when I, and because I was engaged with a team uh, that was suing a um, reactor reactor station, I was doing a lot of research on health, and I saw that the closer you got to a nuclear power station, even when it wasn't having an accident, the more likely you were to have miscarriages and stillbirths and birth defects and tumors and leukemia. And, and so this was astonishing to me and important. And what I found was that nobody wanted to hear it. People's eyes would glaze over. I said, you know, what's, what, da, da, da. And then I saw that most of the social justice and particularly the environmental or, uh, movements and organizations were talking to the public and wringing their hands that the public was apath apathetic uh, and they were trying to scare 
the public. Don't you realize how dangerous this is? Don't you realize what this is doing to uh, et cetera, et cetera? And they were acting as if the people didn't care, as if the public didn't care, as if um, the public was suffering from this apathy. So I looked it up. I went the etymology of it from the Greek, apathean. Uh, Pathean means to suffer. Is ah is the negative? It's the uh, choosing not to suffer or the inability to suffer, the refusal to suffer. And then, boy, that really clicked. And so I began to see, uh, talk to people. How do we deal with something that is painful? And we worked in groups. And, and being able to uh, touch into wh- wh- areas of moral and mental pain and uh, that people were uh, fearful of uh, being uh, alienating from other people, fearful of being viewed as depressing or depressed, fearful of being considered unpatriotic, et cetera, and fearful of pain itself in in this particularly in American culture where we've never had a an invasive war and think the other be I don't want to get into that. But that has been and this is what has made me appreciative of the faith traditions of our planet, uh where um there's this recognition from my root tradition and biblical roots in, in Christianity and in Buddhist, which has been very important to me, that we recognize that suffering happens and that we are able to keep our eyes open so that we can choose how to be with it in a way that doesn't, that's helpful to ourselves and to other people. Now, Joanna, what would you say to that person who says, my fear around feeling all of the suffering I feel about the state of the world is that I'll get stuck in it and yes. I'll just wallow in it forever? Yeah, most people do, I'd say. They feel, oh, once I, once I open the door, I say, <laughs> I've heard people, guys say, say, look, I've got a, a family to feed. I've got a job to keep. Don't ask me to feel what I'm feeling because I'll drown in it and I won't be able to get up in the morning or something. But actually, this is only a feeling. And you're only stuck with things that you're holding at a distance, they're straight arming out um, that you're refusing to experience. Once you experience it, it just boop, it's just a feeling. And then you're actually freer from the uh, it's stranglehold on you. Oh, I can say that. Yeah, I feel terrible. I'm, I'm scared shitless. Oh, I can do. And then in saying that, you find yourself distanced from it, not at its mercy. This is a very basic for many forms of uh, attention and uh, meditation. How do you, how do you make your, uh, direct your attention and presence to you decide to be with the gift of our presence to our world is the biggest gift we can give We can choose to be with our world in a way that opens our minds and our hearts to what, to the suffering that is there. But speaking it, entertaining it, actually uh, creates some distance from the pain or frees you from its stranglehold, frees you up. So I've never known as much hilarity in my life as in the midst of despair work, as we called it. That was the first name for this work, despair work. Despair and empowerment, because being able to voice, and we can see this in our own lives, when you voice what has been 
uh, distracting you and frightening you, it shrinks in, in its power. It's like the Wizard of Oz pulling back the curtain. Or I guess who was it? It was Toto who pulled back the curtain and just realized that it was this little guy. Mm -hmm. What I think is interesting is people often, I think, tend to go to outrage, righteous indignation, anger, that kind of thing, more so than a first move when they're responding to a situation in the world than, can I tell you how I'm suffering hearing this? No, that's, that's you're describing me. Um, I, <laughs> I think I might be describing I, myself, I'm too. I'm a big anger type. And being, yeah, so actually, that's a form of suffering, too. You don't bottle up. Where emotions get dangerous is when you uh, lock them inside and they fester. You know, they're pent up and then explode. Yeah. But, you know, interestingly, when you led this group that you were teaching through a series of sentences that they were to complete and then share their answer with each other. And I want to share yeah. the first two sentences, Joanna, because they were very powerful for me. So you asked people to complete this first sentence. When I look at what we're doing to the natural world, what breaks my heart is, and then people fill in the sentence. And they were in pairs. They would speak it to one other person. And then you had a second sentence. When I see what's happening to human society, what breaks my heart is. And I noticed when I heard these sentences and I heard the phrase, what breaks my heart is, it brought out a very different response than my normal righteous indignation and anger response. It brought something mm. different out in me, what breaks my heart is. So I wanted to talk mm -hmm. about that and why you focus on that language for people to come forward about what's breaking our heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I've over the um, uh, that language I've been using over the last ten, twelve years, I guess. Uh, before, at the very beginning of this, I would use things, you know, what uh, uh, one fear I have about the world, what causes me, you know. But right now, I feel that you can go straight to. Uh, the heartbreak, because that's there underneath. Uh, it's there in the grief, and it's right there under the outrage. Uh, and it's right there uh, under the hopelessness and the um, dread and the, the suffocation of not daring to want to untouched, or rather unverbalized, unaccepted, unexpressed, what happens is that uh, we either shut down, like paralysis, you get paralyzed, you used that word earlier, or uh, just, and those are like twin responses, you can panic. And the paralysis and the panic uh, are like uh, twins that with a, on a seesaw or something because that one can build the other and the panic or social hysteria is a close getting ever closer to the surface in our culture don't you think mm -hmm. yes so we're both we're our culture is gripped by I, I often picture it in my mind as we're walking up the hill toward the future where the sun will peep over the horizon we're all we've locked arms we're going there but on either side of the road we're walking are is a ditch and on and one ditch is paralysis and the other ditch is panic and it's easy to fall into one or the other now, it's interesting when you said we're, we're walking arm in arm and the sun is rising. And I noticed a part of me had this voice inside, Joanna, that said, I just don't buy it. I don't believe it. I want to. That sure sounds great. Is that really the great turning story Joanna's choosing to believe in? That's like some Pollyanna thing. I, I just can't buy it. Yeah, well, I was ch you deliberately choosing a very positive, you know, it, 
that but that where 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 at any point all the time, even as we think we're walking the future, there is because of the darkness of the and immensity of the uh, dangers we're creating and um, wrecking our world over with uh, is are these uh, tendency to close down or erupt and turn on each other. So if you express, if you, ex, if we, and maybe, uh, you know, this doesn't make sense for a lot of people, but it has for, for me and for people who are, if you can speak it and own it, you know, Tammy, we're a country of shut down people. And uh, we can leave them shut down uh, with more uh, uh, um, hopelessness and distrust, and uh, or we can uh, op- let people open up by expressing. Because you see, we are all living parts of a living larger body, our Earth, and we are. We already belong to each other and to the, we may not feel it, Mm -hmm. but at at a given situation, but we breathe the same air, we drink the same water, we are hearing, we are seeing the same sky, we are innards are have the same beautiful uh, intricacy and plumbing that brings forth new life that can paint a picture, we have the same, so that, and there's a drive to, in living systems, to evolve. They're self-organizing and they're self-evolving. So that essential to me has been not only my um, uh, scholarship and, and, and practice in the Buddha Dharma, as well as my Christian roots, but my doctoral work in systems theory, living systems. And living systems uh, want to unfold. And so you really, when you turn off, you can pull down the blinds and lock the door and turn off the tube, but that's not a way you're at your happiest and you're not feeling very fulfilled or alive. Have you ever jumped into a mountain lake or taken a plunge into cold water? Maybe you noticed a change, a feeling of invigoration, suddenly perhaps even feeling more in love with life, maybe even sensed feeling healthier. You may not be aware that there's a method created by a Dutch phenomenon, Wim Hof, known as the Iceman, who gained world acclaim for feats like running a half marathon in the Arctic Circle, barefoot. Here it sounds true. Our staff has been experimenting with the Wim Hof method, and we found pretty remarkable results. We'd love to share the method with you. You can find out more about Wim Hof and his method at findyourcold.com. Okay, a couple of questions here for you. One is that in talking to you right here in this conversation, one of the things that really impresses me is how real it is for you in your experience of being a part of the greater body of the Earth and the Earth's evolutionary process. And I'm wondering, was there an experience you had? Because a lot of people, they've read systems theory and they've studied interdependent co-arising and they understand it theoretically but they don't really know it was there some experience in your life joanna where it lit up for you as a living truth well as a child i loved being on the summers at my grandfather's farm and i uh, but i think that the a moment that that I found, looking back now, is, is so freeing, which was actually over 50 years ago when I was just coming into, I was in the Peace Corps in, in India and beginning to uh, 
um, meet and work with Tibetan refugees and finally drew up the courage to ask for some teachings, but I not for the first year because they were so tired, sick, and hungry. But then when the I, the teachings came, the teaching that uh, I that blew the top off my head was the teaching of uh, uh, no self, that we don't have a permanent separate self. And it was came to me in a way with, through what I was reading and where I was. Uh, I think I mentioned that actually in that talk. Uh, where uh, this is powerful medicine for a people who for the for, for a culture that for 500 years has been uh, steeped in and having drilled into it this hyper individualism this competitive lonely cowboy ego that uh, and the only person you can really rely on is yourself, and that you must be the captain of your ship and the um, master of the, this soul, and that this uh, and the uh, we've come to the point of our journey as hum in humanity of humanity that uh, is showing how the tragic effects of th this kind of conditioning and that uh, so that when I experienced uh, not just conceptually but allow myself to experience what it would be like I to and uh, uh, not being not be a separate permanent self and to be it was like a popcorn popping and all was outside was on the middle, and what was in the center of me was on the outside, and the, the world around me. Now, that has been true, and you can find mystics in every culture, and poets as well, and our other artists, and dancers who have testified to this experience of having a collective uh, identity of, of this uh, feeling this profound uh, interbeing, as Thich Nhat Hanh would call it. It is something that can be experienced. And what I think is, is that that is more consonant with science than with uh, just, you know, the normal way to be. And I've seen it in activists, and I've seen it in Teachers, and I've seen it with the, in the Doctors Beyond Borders. I've seen it in the uh, guides helping people uh, find a way out of a, 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 a deathly situation. That this is a natural thing to feel that you belong, and that mutual belonging is our birthright. And that it fits with science. It also fits with poetry and with your heart. Hmm. It's interesting that you said I'm when, ranting, when the, I? no, I like it. It's interesting when you said when the top blew off my head, and then you used the image of a, a kernel of popcorn popping. I, I really liked both of those. Now you you talk, Joanna, about the Earth and its evolutionary process. The Earth is our greater body. If you were to Give voice, if you will, to the Earth's evolutionary process as you see it right now. What would that be? How, how do you think the, the big body of the Earth is seeing where we are and where we're going? I, I don't really um, make a great effort to try to do that, because, uh, Tammy, because... Uh, it's beyond my capacity. I'm very um, affected by and grateful to uh, cosmologists and scientists uh, like um, Brian Swim, who who are seeing uh, the um, uh, rising of Gaia consciousness. All I know is that uh, I belong to this earth that I have been part of its evolution 
and uh, my journey didn't start when I uh, came out of my mother's vagina, nor did it start when I became a, a, a her her that cell in with my conception. It began uh, with her conception and the mothers and fathers before her. I go back, back, back through time. And this is one of the um, practices that we, whole set of practices that we do in the work that reconnects to expand our sense of uh, lived time, expand our temporal context so that we're more than just this little uh, span from our birth to our death in this lifetime, but that we have been on the way uh, through countless generations and even before that in countless life forms. We remember that in our mother's womb. We have um, tail like a fish and gills. We have the forms are repeated themselves in them, you know, phylogeny, recapitulates, whatever, that they, that we re review our whole journey. That whole journey of uh, life on our earth is what has brought us here. And in contemporary science, both in systems and in the holographic view of uh, our universe and our planet, uh, the whole is, we're not only part of a whole, but the whole is in us. And it is, uh, there are, people are experiencing that mystically, they're experiencing that sometimes uh, right on the barricades. They're experiencing that with um, uh, um, medicines that expand the consciousness mm -hmm. from um, mind expanding uh, plant and theogens um, so that there's, we're, we're at a moment in our history when we're being asked to expand to the as much as we can to the mystery that is inside us, the power and the beauty of this generative um, journey, and that it can um, not only be an amusing uh, occupation to do that, but it can give you a tremendous sense of, wow, I belong here. Wow, I have this vision. I will do anything I can to keep, to preserve the uh, fertility and the verdancy and the intricacy of the life forms of this planet. This is my home. This is a wonder. And people, this is, and people, you get, you get high off it. You feel this is why I'm here. It makes you glad. I'd rather be glad than depressed. But let's talk to that person, because you've said a couple of times this idea of feeling this deep sense of belonging. And I agree with you. That's such a fulfilling feeling, something we all want, something we long for. But what about that person who says, you know, I feel very sensitive and I don't belong on a planet filled with as much vulgarity and grossness and pain and terribleness as is here on planet Earth. I don't feel like I belong. I feel like an outsider. Oh, yeah, well, that, I've heard that. Yeah, well, that's perfectly fine. Sure. I have, I have, and I say you're perfectly right. I have, I sometimes feel that too. Let me out of here. Let's talk about it. Let's, uh, let's act it out. You get, it can get pretty funny, actually, because uh, our body knows underneath this, uh, the words and the, uh, that we use and the feelings we decide to express that there is a body that knows it needs this air, that knows it needs this water, that wants this water to be clean, that knows that it wants another body to hold and be held. So that our bodies it's often our scary minds that want to make these 
statements of, uh, I don't like it, I don't like it, I don't want to be here. But underneath is a body that uh, knows that it belongs because it needs, it's dependent on the belonging, physically dependent. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense it to do, you? It does make sense, and I think it's very beautiful, actually, what you're saying. I mean, I'm taking a quote now from one of the building blocks, principles of the work that reconnects, and the quote is, Unblocking, unblocking our energy of engagement occurs when our pain for the world is experienced and expressed. And it sounds like that's a lot of what you're talking about here, that we need to both experience it and talk about it, talk about it to other people. That's right, because then you find that a lot of company, there isn't anybody in the room who doesn't feel that same uh, Fear, horror, disgust, outrage, grief, loathing. You know, it, 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 in various ways, you have your own particular cocktail of it. But to sort of join the crowd uh, and that, uh, so that it's, it's what we need to do, what in our culture has done, Tammy, is it has pathologized our feelings of distress and fear and loathing about what's happening to our world. Mm -hmm. And it's been people, the dominant model in psychotherapy still has been to try to uh, see what was the biographic cause in your early childhood or something. And whereas a key moment, I mean, key for me from the first moment with this work was to realize, oh boy, we better... Uh, I, and I need to sh help people see that when you're feeling this sadness, revulsion, grief over what we're doing, that is not neurotic or psychotic or pathology, any pathology. It is wholesome. It is healthy. Our pain for the world is simply one side of the coin, and the other side is our love for the world. They co-arise. Because it, why does it distress you to see the homeless and hungry and even little kids on the street? It's because you know in your heart that's not to be done. You can't accept that this is how we're treating people. So your your depression over the homeless or over the um, plutonium blowing around out at Rocky Flats is uh, because it has its root in a deep caring. Mm -hmm. So that was our discovery when we started the work. And that caring is because we belong. We are interwoven with each other. Now, you took the people in this workshop through yet a third question that they could share with their partner, where they fill in the sentence, and it was, if I could access all the power that there is for me coming through the web of life, the one thing I would do for the sake of my world is, and then dot, 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 people fill that in. What's the one thing I would do? And one thing I read in your work, Joanna, that I thought was interesting was that you said the steps we take can be modest ones, but they should involve some risk to our mental and social comfort, lest we remain caught in old safe limits. Courage is a great teacher and bringer of joy. So I wanted to talk about doing this one thing that we might want to do for the sake of our world and that it should involve some risk to our mental and social comfort. What do you mean? What kind of risk are you talking about here? Well, it could be, diff it could be different um, any, uh, today than tomorrow, but it could be a risk uh, like talking to your neighbor about uh, what's... Uh, uh, the happening around the corner and the um, or the homeless camp or the taking the risk of sharing your feelings with someone 
That's, I mean, that's, or it could be taking the risk of running for city council. Mm -hmm. What would you say are the risks that you've taken in your life that have really been important and you thought to yourself, this is a risk, this is risky, I'm going to do it, I'm going to step out of my safe zone and do this thing? Well, doing this work was, to me, I was scared all the time. There was, in the first years of pulling people together in the first workshops, they were called Despair and Empowerment. I was, felt pretty sure that people would, I expected people to walk out. And when my teenage children at one point said, oh, we'd like to come, I said, oh, no, 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 you don't need to know, you don't need to come. And it was because I didn't want to see them to to see me fail so it was very because i hadn't seen anybody else do this before so but i just had this strong hunch that we that's what we need so actually <laughs> actually uh, i wondered later whether i just tried to discourage my teenage daughter and son from coming because I didn't want to know how they felt about their world. <laughs> and, and, uh, but they did come. And it was uh, uh, life-changing for all of us. You know, they, 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 it breeds courage and it breeds solidarity. And I see, I see it's affected their lives, what they've done. My daughter working as medical social worker with HIV children, she's faced with an AIDS. She's facing pain all the time. And the, uh, my son, he's uh, been in, right on the ground floor uh, um, creating zero waste programs here that are now being adopted around the world. Oh, you will certainly omit this from this interview. Don't ever have a bragging mother on your show. I'm happy to hear hear you as a, <laughs> a bragging mother, which actually does bring me to something I wanted to ask you. At 88, when you feel into your life now, everything you've done in the outer world and the inner world and your family life, what brings you the most sense of fulfillment? Mm. Well, I have, uh, I have a, it's not what I've done that moves me so. It's what I've opened to. Before coming home to sit and wait for your call, Tammy, I was watching the clock and I went for a walk in my neighborhood to exercise my body and breathe the fresh air. It's a beautiful, uh, cloudy, sunny day. And and I was, again, just uh, getting almost intoxicated with the freshness of the air, uh, the, the generosity of a world that puts out its leaves and yeah, I, I moved to, I think that's what I'm most grateful for, is that the path I have been, that opened for me and that I took has helped me uh, so love my world. Hmm. And I I think that's, and I want to tell you, you know, I was, I, I'm at, at, at um, 88, turning 89, I'm still scared. This time it's that I'm so old and forgetful and how, why, how, appear, appearing in public with my uh, wrinkled face and all of that. Because, uh, you know, you don't leave your uh, vanity behind by completely, you know. Well, Joanna, now I have to tell you a story, which is last night I was telling my wife, I get to interview Joanna Macy tomorrow. Look at her face. Look at how beautiful she is. Look at the sparkle in those eyes and the natural wrinkles in her face. We both just <laughs> sat there looking at your picture, 
remarking how beautiful you are. <laughs> True story. Oh, oh, I guess I will have to uh, just take that in that and put that behind True. my left ear. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I need to say this too, Tammy, that I, I'm not brimming with hope, and or am I? Uh, about what will happen to our planet for as a home for complex life forms. Nor am I uh, sunk in despair. But I know that it's, uh, to me, it's even, Stephen, what's going to happen. Because it's, and in a way, I can, um, I know it's out of my hands. I'll do what I can for the great turning, but if the great unraveling unravels to the point where new ways of being and organizing ourselves uh, can't turn it around, uh, that's okay too, because once we know who we really are, once we know that we belong that we're to the living body of earth, then we're already home. Maybe that's what I was, why I, what I was feeling so moved as I walked around the neighborhood before we talked. Uh, we belong now and we always belong. We've always belonged. And that somehow, as you let it take hold, it, it actually uh, can seem enough. That's wonder enough. Now, when you said, even Stephen, the great unraveling or the great turning, and that that's not what you're basing this sense of open aliveness on, I'm with you. And that's right. The great unraveling. Right. I, I, I now, think I, if people tell me that it's a sure thing we're going to pull through, it makes me want to prove them wrong because it seems so fatuous and it seems so diminishing of the true drama of the moment we're in. We are actually in a moment where everything can be lost of the complex life forms, of the intelligence that has grown on this. But we're still in the body of Earth, and it's still a living system. And so we've, uh, and isn't it beautiful to be able to hold up your head and laugh in the wind at a time like this? That's another form of the beauty of our earth. Your courage, your showing up week after week for this show, that making podcasts that mean so much to people, however you feel, whatever else is pulling at you. There's so much beauty. Now, Joanna, I want to ask you a question, though, about this even Stephen situation for a moment, which is we hear so many different visions of the great unraveling. You know, there's three or four movies out at any given time that are apocalyptic of some form or another. But we don't have, I don't think, very many images of the great turning of what this could actually be like. And I wonder if you carry a vision inside of the great turning. Yeah. I think that it has, uh, I don't think we're going to uh, be able to make it around this with this challenge uh, without rediscovering our love for this planet and our mutual belonging in this, in her, in this fountain of, of uh, beauty and life and, and intelligence. It's all we have. And it's been beautiful, so we can be grateful. I know there's been terrible things in the history uh, as we know it, but there have been great, great forms, living forms of great intricacy and intelligence and great works of art and great acts of nobility. And uh, if you can, uh, to me, the deep time work as part of the work that reconnects is some, has been the most uh, spiritually and emotionally transforming. 
Uh, it has helped me move beyond just Joanna's lifetime, but to see the larger uh, drama and landscape of which I am a part. And before we, uh, when I felt a little stab of inadequacy thinking about how I might measure up in this interview with you, uh, I immediately uh, uh, thought, oh, I'll just ask the future ones to be there. Because hmm. I, I invite them into my life a lot. I dedicate. How do you how do you do that? How what, what do you, you you visualize people from the future being here? Listen, yeah. uh huh. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Oh yeah, and you know, uh, the most beautiful of the work that I think is is in the deep time work where we we talk in pairs, but we talk across seven generations, and one will be talking as if she's living in. Uh, 2218, and the other is just 2018. That's about seven generations. Or it could be a much bigger time span. But it's a uh, feeling that, that uh, you see, technology and our market forces uh, have uh, made time, have accelerated time, and uh, and wanting and, and introduce very short term thinking. But our ancestors could think across generations. They could work on a stone, a chiseling a do- portal for a cathedral that they'd never see in their own lifetimes. And they could get meaning from uh, taking part in building something that uh, would flourish for those who came after, but they'd never see. That's perfectly possible. And it's very, uh, it's, it, it's ennobling in a way, if you don't mind my sounding too, claiming too much, but it gives a little sprinkling <laughs> maybe of, an, of nobility to your life that you're engaged in something that makes perfect sense to you and that embodies your love for the ongoing journey of humanity and the future ones, even if you won't see it yourself. And that we're so, we really, our lives are bigger than the uh, being consumers or being performers on the stage right now. Mm Mm-hmm. This is the what, yeah, what they call the ecological self, or there are other terms, but there's a, uh, we're part of a, we're much bigger than we, our culture gives us credit for. And we have, we can nurture a sense of uh, roots and continuity uh, that give us, um, lend uh, meaning and inspiration to our lives. Okay, I just have one final question. You talked about the great ancient nature of your life, that your life didn't start when you came out of your mother's womb. And I wonder, at 88, almost 89, when you imagine your own death, what your feelings are about that at this point, what your view is at this point. Oh, well, I think about that quite a bit because I'm getting to the uh, close to the age my immediate ancestors uh, kicked the bucket, popped off or whatever, moved on, passed over. Um, so I'm curious. It's mainly uh, I don't uh, – I uh, don't want to live forever. And I, I'm glad that there'll be things I gave my heart, mind, and body to that will pass on in these in these patterns of practices. I think some will. I think that, as a matter of fact, I've even had the nerve to think uh, that some of these practices will become intrinsic to the spirituality of the third millennium. Beautiful. 
But I don't know if you really answered the question fully in terms of your own emotional oh, orientation, well, if you will. I'd be curious to know about Oh, well, that. I'm going to um, go into the ground after I die near where we placed my husband's body exactly nine years and two days ago. Um, he died on the first inauguration of President Obama. And uh, I'm going to go into the soil without a coffin, just a shroud. This is now, you didn't expect me to be this graphic, I bet. But I'm part of the circle of life. There's a beautiful meditation that I created with um, John Seed, you know, where we're saying giving thanks. We, we will recycle our lives into the great body of earth. We will will our, where we will become and we will love uh, the dissolution of our lives and the plump worms we, and beetles we will become. I have enjoyed talking to you so much, Joanna Macy. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a beautiful human being you are. You inspire me. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. I hope I meet you sometime. I would like that. I would like that a lot. We could walk around your block together. It would be glorious. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Good. I've been speaking with Joanna Macy. She is an eco-philosopher and the author of many books, including Active Hope and Coming Back to Life, the updated guide to the work that reconnects. Thank you for listening to Insights at the Edge. You can read a full transcript of today's interview at soundstrue.com forward slash podcast. And if you're interested, hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. And also, if you feel inspired, head to iTunes and leave Insights at the Edge a review. I love getting your feedback, being in connection with you, and learning how we can continue to evolve and improve our program. Working together, I believe, we can create a kinder and wiser world. Soundstrue.com, waking up the world.